welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilson, and I'm joined by Dan Howarth, my co-host and deputy editor of This Is Horror. Evening. How's it going? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Welcome back. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's all right. (laughs) I mean, Bob did his best to oust you, but, you know, didn't happen, did it? No, not really. I'd say back by popular demand, but this is horror is very much a dictatorship, so <laughs> it's not popular demand, it's just your demand. Oh dear. Well, I can't comment on that remark. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm looking forward to this one. We've got T. E. Grau on the show, who of course we commissioned for a new story next year. Indeed. Something to look forward to. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, have you got his bio? I have. So, T. Grau is an author of dark fiction whose work has been featured in over two dozen anthologies, magazines, literary journals, and audio platforms. His limited edition novellas, The Mission and The Lost Aklo Stories, were released in late summer 2014 by Dynatox Ministries, Dunham's Manor Press. T. Grau lives in Los Angeles with his wife and daughter and can be found in the ether at the Cosmocomicon which is cosmocomicon.blogspot.com. The Nameless Dark marks his first collection of short fiction. All right. Well, with that said, shall we get him on the podcast? Yeah, definitely. And now for a horror interview. Ted, welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. Thank you, sir. How's it going? Good to be here. Great, great. It's, everything's great. Um, it's Sunday morning, the sun's out, um, everything's grand. So I thought to start with, Ted, if we could look at how you got your interest in horror. Um, my interest in horror, I guess, has been lifelong, but I guess, um, but as, as a child, I wasn't really obsessed with horror as much as I was obsessed with fantasy. Um, I, I grew up in the mid to late 70s, and so... D and D was a big part of my life, and so I, I guess that was my first immersion into fantastical fiction and the, the, those sort of concepts and things like that. So I guess I, I I grew up more with fantasy, but I was always drawn to the darker side of fantasy, like you know the the ghouls and goblins and demons and and things like that. But I didn't really turn full force to to uh, horror as a, a reader or as a writer until probably um, I would say late 2009 when um, I was working on a script and uh, a screenplay and um, it was a horror script and um, I was working on it with another writer and he knew that I was into cosmic horror, Lovecraft, things like that and so he he wanted me to bring out more of those elements to the um, screenplay so I, I started to read more Lovecraft, and I hadn't really read him since college. Um, I, I read a few of his books and thought they were amazing, but it didn't really stick. Um, and so through this screenplay, I, I, I started to reread um, Lovecraft like wholesale, and I, I probably read about 10 to 15 stories. And, um, and, and then in doing that, I found out that, 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 that someone could actually write Lovecraftian fiction and they could write stories in that genre and I had no idea up to that point and then so I started to I started to turn my mind towards writing fiction and then Ivy my wife said you know what you don't really enjoy writing scripts anymore Um, you know you've been doing it for about 10 years and you know you haven't really had any kind of success with it because I, wasn't very, I would I would tend to overwrite a screenplay and it would always turn into sort of like a novel length uh, adaptation sort of thing so she goes why don't you just write cosmic horror and um, and sort of you know move in, in that direction and write prose because prose is, is kind of where, where, where your heart is anyway so just you know you should write prose stop with all this nonsense when you know uh, with screenplays and things like that and I said really and she said yeah just just Try that, and I did, and I wrote uh, my first story was Transmission, and I got it sold and published, um, 
And so that was sort of my uh, start. And that was, I guess, about mid-2010. Um, and then ever since, I've just, you know, I, I, I felt, felt like I had to make up for lost time when, when as, you know, as it, 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 it uh, pertained to horror, you know, reading, uh, you know, all the, all the old pulp masters, you know, Clark Ashton Smith, Robert E. Howard, and then I just kind of branched out from there. And now I'm just like, you know, fully enthralled and stuck. <laughs> so the screenplay that you were working on, is that something that got made into a film or is that something that you decided to adapt into a story? It went like a, nowhere. A short story, of course, because <laughs> obviously it was a story as a screenplay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was a story as a screenplay. I, I was working on it. I, I was sort of like hired. I was kind of like a hired gun. That's kind of where I was at that point. I, I wasn't really, and I didn't have an agent. I wasn't selling my own stuff, but people knew that, that I could write, I guess. Um, and so he, he hired me to come in and help him write it. And then, and I guess when it was, I don't even think I even finished that script but it, you know the old hollywood story it, it never went anywhere you know right. i mean it, it, <laughs> scripts are written by, by the tens of thousands each year and you know they just sit on shelves now so do you think that the uh, the process of writing screenplays has informed your writing of, of fiction in any way um i think so because and and people have said that that it almost seems like um Certain scenes that I write almost seem like a tracking shot in a in a film, probably because I I mean you know I grew up in a you know watching film and TV and things like that, um, so I I see things as I guess you know cinematically, so you know I, I I see lighting and and I see atmospherics and I see how things are set in in a room. I see the blocking of the characters um and and, and I, I don't know if that really helps my my story sometimes because i think i can tend to focus too much on you know what a character is doing in that room how they're moving how they're walking if they stand up or, or sit down or but um but that's kind of the way i see it in my head and maybe that's from you know years of watching film and then also years of writing scripts where you have to you know sort of tell the actors what to do, or you not know, tell them what to do, suggest what they do in um, each scene. So, yeah, maybe that's an influence. Um, I, I, I think you can see that, that, really, though. It's like, it's a, it's a good thing to have your characters active, you know, who yeah. who kind of stand still or sit still while they're having a conversation. You know, it's, yeah. you know, if people are always active, and I think your fiction reflects that, and clearly hearing you talking about writing a screenplay shows yeah. where that, that influence comes from, so... Yeah, that's a good thing, in my opinion. Well, thank God. <laughs> well, one of the stories that's bringing to mind for me is Expat, which is in your Nameless Dark collection. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. I mean, I think, like, a, a lesser writer might have not really known what to do with that, because if you kind of look at the bare bones of the story, it's quite slender, but you really kind of fleshed it out. You can see the movement of the character, the thoughts of the character, and one hell of a twist at the end as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's it's sort of a claustrophobic um, story. which, um, And so I, I had to make that interesting, and I had to make that, you know, come alive. And um, because, you know, it's, it's sort of, it all almost all takes place in that flat in uh, Prague. And so, yeah, I, I guess I guess I just wanted to inhabit that and make sure that the reader knew exactly what was going on in each scene and how each room was laid out. Um, because I think sort of the dynamics of where people are and the, uh, I guess, again, the blocking of the characters in, in that story is uh, important to the end, you know, to, I guess, you know, to that twist ending in the end. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's an example in terms of genre, just how difficult your stories are to actually categorize. I mean, you blend Thank cosmic you. horror with kind of mm. what I term real life human cruelty and then also <laughs> the weird, which I mean, the weird these days is just a complete kind of 
melting pot for all sorts of things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and you know, and thank you for that, because I, I, I think with this collection of, of stories, and uh, you, you can kind of see where I started with the Lovecraftian mythos type stories, because that's where I started. I, I, I mean, those are kind of like my my training wheels. I often think that Lovecraft and his influence were like, you know, training wheels for me to say, it's okay to write prose. It's okay to, um, you know, write horror fiction. And here's how, here's how you can do it. And, you know, I'll hold you up and you can write in this universe and, you know, tell stories with that backdrop that's already been, that's already been established. I think that, you know, in, in the, you know, in the stories, you can kind of see my influences changing over time because it, you know it was written over five years and so you know you can see the earlier tales were informed by Clark Ashton Smith, Lovecraft, um, uh, Hodgson, people like that and and you know because that's what I was into as a as a reader at, at that point in time then I, I started to read a little bit more broadly and I started to read more noir fiction um, and then so you know out of that came Beer and Worms and Clean um, and then, you know, I just started to read, you know, more generally in horror fiction. And then, and, and so I wanted to sort of get out of that sort of safe comfort zone of the, you know, Cthulhu mythos and things like that. And just write just dark stories, weird stories, uncanny stories, strange stories. And then, you know, and I think that um, you can see that because then I, I started to write stories like Tubby's Big Swim and Expat and things like that, that, that don't really fit in any sort of a established um, genre that's, you know, that's, that's already, that's, it's, you know, easy to label, I guess. So let's backtrack a little, because we know that you kind of went to fiction through screenwriting, and then you had your short story collection <laughs> commissioned, but obviously there was a lot that went on in between <laughs> those two things, so I wondered if you could talk us through that and indeed your foray into editing as well yeah i um i yeah like i said earlier i i wrote transmission and sold that to um dead but dreaming 2 an, an anthology and then I, I was sort of on that path um and and then i started to get invites you know from transmission i started to get invites to more lovecraftian anthologies and and um those those sorts of projects. So I stayed in, in, in that genre and sort of followed the jobs, basically, um, and then um, wrote stories, maybe six to ten stories that were Lovecraftian. Um, and then, but you know, but but I always had other stories while you know while I was doing that because that was based on invites mostly. Um, you know, I, and I, I was so grateful that I was being invited to write for a for a book that I, I would always say yes it, it didn't matter if I didn't have a, an idea for it I would um, come up with, with an idea for it because I was really grateful that I was uh, that people liked my stuff and they wanted me to be in, be in their books and then I just but I kept writing side stories um, that that weren't really Lovecraftian in in, in theme or in, or in tone and then so I, I just kept writing almost like um, almost with like two different hands parallel to you know to each other, and um, and then I guess at some point I, I figured out that that I had enough stories for a collection of uh, of fiction, and then I had to had to weigh how much of the earlier stuff, which which you know, with how much of the more recent stories, and um, and you know I wanted to strike a balance, but I also didn't want to leave things out um, that that I thought were good stories, even though they might be a little bit redundant as far as, um, you know, being inspired by, you know, mythos fiction and things like that. But um, I think, you know, I think I struck, I, I struck, I struck a good balance with this, uh, this book and, and, you know, um, and, and, and also for me and for my family and, and, you know, I wanted to show the arc of where I was as a writer, you know, up to the present time. Um, I thought, I thought that was important. And how did it feel after so much time kind of working away on it to finally get that out into the world? And not only that, but to have received such, you know, great praise from not only magazines, but your peers within fiction writing. 
It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> As a reader, my whole life, you know, I never thought that I would have a book out. I mean, I, I, you know, I always, in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be a, you know, an, an, an author, you know, of prose. So, you know, something for a book. But I would, I would never assume or, or imagine that one day that that I would have a, a book of my work on a, on a on a shelf somewhere. And the feedback has been just overwhelming. When I sent out um, uh, the like final draft of that for blurbs um, you know the 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 response that I got from my peers was just overwhelming it was I, I you know I would just I my jaw would hang open and um, I don't know if, if everyone's being like really really nice um, just <laughs> because they feel sorry for me or what but it, it's it's been really really amazing and um, and that's I mean that's why you do it because you know you don't write horror fiction or weird fiction for the money you don't write it for the fame you don't write it for anything else but the love of telling your stories telling you know hopefully stories that resonate with with the reader and when it resonates with a peer who you admire respect and think is in a an amazing writer I mean that's that's like you know goal achieved and um and yeah it's it's been fantastic the the reviews have been great from readers the feedback from peers has been great um it's you know my book is now in libraries across the country which which to me is probably like the strangest thing of all that people can walk into a library um and check my book out and read it i mean that that to me is just because i i, I always you know i think of a library as a repository for um, information and wonder and creativity and you know all the all the good things and magic um, and now you know in certain libraries my book is part of that and that's you know that's that's my goal that's my goal and it's been achieved you know maybe this is just the start but that, that that first step has been achieved and I'm you know I'm really grateful and very proud and humbled and happy about it Oh, yeah, and rightfully so. And, you know, in terms of sitting there on the bookshelf, that cover you have is just uh -huh. amazing. I mean, <laughs> Thank it, you. it kind of looks like something that I could imagine uh, on, like, a heavy metal album of, say, Celtic yeah. Frost. It's got that real kind yeah. of macabre, yeah, grungy buddy. feel to it, and it, it, it really <laughs> is very apt. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, again, you know, I'm a fantasy geek you know I, I grew up you know reading heavy metal and reading dragon magazine and um you know you know the artwork of of, of, of boris and, and and people like that and so that's that's ingrained in my you know inner core my dna so i've i've always loved that sort of fantasy style um and then ivy and i were looking for artists for the cover because i mean this was this was prior to you know signing any deals or anything like that but we were just trying to find you know what would be a cool cover and she came across this artist um arnaud de valois and um she goes oh what about this guy and and when i when i saw it when i saw this this very image um something like clicked inside me something shifted and i'm like that is it that must be the cover for my first collection and then so i contacted him and purchased it and worked it out and you know he's he was you know he's very lovely about it and you know very cool about it and then so i secured the cover prior to even selling the um <laughs> the manuscript because 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 i i had to have i mean you know i grew up with iron maiden and you know all those great album covers and meatloaf i remember bat out of hell i used to stare at that album cover um i was probably about eight mm, seven or eight and I used to just stare at that album cover um, for hours and hours on end and you know the covers of like Kiss albums and Molly Hatchet and, and um, you know even like you know some of those prog bands like Yes and um, people like that I would and Rush um, so you know it, it, so when I saw this I knew that it was perfect for what I wanted to do and what what I wanted to say, and and plus, I mean, I think that covers are such an important part of of the process, and you know, and there's some amazing covers out there, but there's also sad to say in 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 our genre, horror fiction, weird fiction, dark fiction, that that, that there's just 
people don't put enough time and effort and quality into their covers and that really is your calling card you know when it's when it's on a, on a shelf all it is is that image that image is the you know the, the, the first impression that a reader will see and i think that people should spend more time and money and, and hire and there's you know there's tons of amazing artists that you know that, that do fantasy and, and horror artwork and if people would just give them work and you know commission them to do covers i think that it would add more respectability and you know and i, I know it's just like a superficial packaging sort of thing but I, I think all that matters um presentation matters covers are that calling card that's that first impression for our our genre and i think that people should put more time and money into it and creativity into it and then of course other things like font and paper quality and things like that but that's you know for a another day I don't the, want to write too much I totally agree though the product you know obviously the writing is is vital and you'd rather well, read a, a good book written on toilet paper than a bad you know a bad one that's right. beautifully produced but I think part of getting horror's reputation out of you know essentially where some of it is in you know kind of some people view it as a niche I think part of that does come as, as people taking more pride of of the finished product, like you say. Really, I think that's I think that's quite an important part. You know, cover, paper quality. You know, if it does make a real difference, I think that's one thing that maybe horror as a genre at times can lack behind. Absolutely, and and you know, and and font as well, and just like you know, the placement of of, of the font on the cover, and not doing it too spooky and like you know, scary font. Um, just 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 I mean, you know. The stuff that I'm reading by my peers is 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 so elegant and beautiful, and you know, even though it, it you know quote you know it is horror fiction, that you know I think the wider industry and the readership thinks of it as being juvenile and sophomoric and silly, and you know, and 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 it's not. It's you know, it's as uh, cutting and as um, you know exploratory of the human. Um, psyche and uh, uh, dysfunction as anything else out there um, and I think that you know it's it, it's high time because now the quality is there I mean I, I can't speak for you know last decade a decade prior because I wasn't really re reading that stuff I wasn't reading a lot of King and Barker and, and, and I guess more of the smaller stuff but now that the stuff I'm reading now is is it, it's so beautiful and it deserves respect and I think that that respect can be you know you know aided in a small way by the packaging the presentation of, of what we write of, of, of what we do as as um, uh, writers and, and, and artists and I think that people people need to be led to it now and almost reintroduced to dark fiction and and the weird and the uncanny because I think that when people think horror fiction they think of slasher films and you know freddy and jason and you know big monsters that are kind of like silly um but i think you know what's what's going on now with with everything that i'm reading it's it's so elegant that the packaging needs to match that and, and i think hopefully that will help bring people around to take it seriously as you know literature because it is. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is something, this is a drum that you banged for a while though, Michael, isn't it? It's, oh, yeah. You know, a yeah. lot of kind of mainstream attention that comes on crime fiction. You know, I, I, can, I can't remember the specific example you, you often use, but the line is very thin, isn't it, between, you know, what is horror, what is crime? And depending on the marketing and the cover and the packaging, you know, that, that's what kind of keeps a book, you know, to a niche audience or pushes it over the edge into a supermarket setting really and that's you know that's something that maybe we do need to get better at as a genre really yeah crime is horror too and and i think that horror writers need to embrace more crime fiction because i think crime is horror it's just it's just true life horror it's it, it, it's the horror of, of of humanity which is actually far worse and far more dangerous and more threatening to us as as human beings than you know a, a, an elder god which isn't real i don't think <laughs> um, so I think, that, and and I've I've sort of found a little bit of snobbery towards crime crime fiction from other horror authors, which I think is is sad because I think we're all in the same boat. We're all doing quote unquote genre fiction, and I think that we should embrace each other as brothers and sisters and 
comrades in arms and um, and you know try to you know read more broadly on on both sides and you know I mean, it, it, it it does come from from the same germ you know it, it comes from exploring the dark exploring you know the twisted things in inside humanity and inside uh, the, the universe and inside our own planet and I think it's it, it's all good and it, it all feeds off of each other and you know I, I think that there should be more I guess interrelation and melding um, between genres. Yeah, I mean, if you know, if you only read within your genre anyway, you know, how limited is your fiction going to be? I mean, you know, exactly. some of the new, the nuanced and, as you say, the elegant fiction that you get now is because people read widely and read well. You know, it's it doesn't matter what you read as long as what you read is good. Yes, yes, exactly, and so, and, and like I said, if, if it's if it's about you know the darkness within all of us and, and within everyday life, it's it's all the same. It's just you know it's just based on the trappings. Um, that's what you know I guess divides it. Uh, but yeah, it's yeah I think that all horror writers should read more crime fiction like Lawrence Block. Oh, we love Lawrence Block on this podcast, uh, don't we, Michael? Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, he's very sweet, actually. Um, Ivy did an interview with Lawrence Block, and I published one of his stories on my blog. If I can give a little plug, the Cosmo Comic Con. It, it, it's it's the story like a bone in the throat, um, and it's it's one it's it's everyone should read it on my blog or you know in in a book. You should buy a Lawrence Block book. I mean, he's one of the finest authors out there, and he's he's dark and he's brutal and he's funny and um you know i i was really really I, I was honored to you know to put out his work but also i noticed that when i published that tale and the interview i mean this guy's a legend he's written over a hundred novels and a thousand short stories and, and and also a very very sweet guy and, and and still alive so you can contact him and interact with him i i noticed that when i i put that out the response from my, my, my horror peers was 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 you know, very very low, and I thought that that was strange because Lawrence Block is who you should be reading if you want to be a better writer of any genre or no genre. He's I mean he's that good. Film just came out last year. Yeah, it's I just think that um, there's a bit of snobbery I think, and people kind of tend to put on put on their blinders and want to just focus on one thing and that's their world and that's it and I think that that's sad and limiting um, not even just as a, as a writer but as a reader and, and just as you know someone who thinks about these things because I mean all, all of these stories occupy your brain and that and I think that you're closing off your world your universe if you only read in one narrow genre read more crime fiction read more Lawrence Block yeah, I completely endorse that message, and I think as well, I mean, in terms of Lawrence Block and his output, we sometimes talk about books on writing, and Lawrence Block has released a lot of books just talking about the craft of writing. For right. years, he was a columnist for Writer's Digest, I believe, mm -hmm. and then now he's kind of uh, published those I uh, serialized them within two or three books and you know it's all great stuff like they're all a couple of pages each uh, each column so if yeah. you're looking for just quick writing inspiration pick up one of the Lawrence Block books and you know I think that's gonna really help with a craft and I suppose now is a good time to talk about that particularly as there are probably a lot of people who are starting writing, as seems to happen every November when NaNoWriMo comes round. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, everything you've said in terms of the connection and the relationship between horror and crime, I completely agree with. I think Jim Thompson is another fine writer that everyone should check out if they haven't already. People like Elmore Leonard as well. Yep. Um and Christopher I mean, Koch, Lee Henderson, I think it's Lee or Henderson Lee. No, I think it's Lee Henderson. I read a novel, Fourth of July Creek, that is it, it's almost like Laird Barron without the cosmic elements to it. It's it, it it's set in um, I think Montana. Yeah, it's set in like like the wilds of, of Montana, and it, it but it's it's a very noir. It's kind of like mountain noir. It's 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 an incredible crime. 
um, novel, but it's very dark and very brutal and talks about family and nature and uh, conspiracy and government and everything. And, and it's just that that book, I think I read it last year, that book really has stayed with me. And I think about it from time to time. Um, uh, and, and, you know, again, that's it's uh, one more thing that, that hopefully informs me as a writer, but but also just as a, as a reader and a, and a fan of, of all things dark. And I think as well, just in terms of whether something's crime or horror, it can sometimes be as simple as a marketing label, or it can yep. indeed be the cover that they put on to take things <laughs> full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's marketing really does um, a disservice at times because they, they, you know, marketers and the big publishers and even smaller ones, you know, smaller press as well, always want to be able to to market that which 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 makes sense of course because i mean they, they want to make money off it but it can, it can also n narrow the scope um you know the impact of that work um and so yeah i i think that there should be less emphasis on you know what what shelf it's supposed to be on that's why i i think when i you know discuss these things i i, I tend to use dark fiction because um you know when you say you know mythos fiction or weird fiction or uncanny fiction or uh, the you know uh, ghost stories or things like that. I think it, then then it almost puts that on that shelf. It, it puts that on that very narrow shelf. When it, you know when if it's all dark fiction, it should be read by people that enjoy dark you know dark fiction and, and dark things. Yeah, and when I was talking on the Lit Reactor podcast, I mean I said in terms of me and this is horror. What I'm concerned with is good fiction and just expanding the definition of horror because I think as you said before when you talked about slasher films sometimes in in the public's mind or in the mind of the non horror fan it's an awfully narrow remit but really horror is so encompassing and I, I think writers such as yourself and a lot of the people you know we're seeing both in terms of the small presses and indeed uh, writers with the bigger presses such as Adam Neville at the moment mm, um, Adam. yes sir you know we're, we're really I hope challenging the perception of what it is um, what horror is and just how mm. far that can come and um, I, I mean maybe there's been such an emphasis on uh, traditional horror and tropes that people are now deciding to rebel against that and to ask well how do we really scare someone? What's frightening? Now write mm -hmm. about that. I mean, I've mentioned it before, but I think Disintegration by Richard Thomas is a fantastic example of that, where you've got a man who quite literally loses everything, and it came about because Richard Thomas asked, right, what would be the scariest thing for me personally? And then he wrote about right. it. <laughs> right, right, yeah. That's, I mean, that's that's important. We all have to write about what we find horrifying, um, and you know, it, <clears throat> I guess that's the you know, I guess that's the true uh, blood coursing through horror is is what what scares you, um, and that's why I, I think you know some of the things that I write about um, to me aren't really scary <laughs> it's it, it's more it's more about writing about something that i find cool or i find uh wondrous um but you know i i, I do take on things that that, that that i find horrifying but i think that you know when it comes to like cosmic uh, horror and things like that and cosmic tropes i don't think of those things as being scary so much as, as just being cool i think that you know being you know raised in a very religious household and then um, reading about ideas um, to where there is no God, there is no heaven, no, you know, there aren't angels and, and um, saints and things like that, but that, that, that the universe is just a cold, brutal, un uncaring place that doesn't care if you're alive or dead, you're just a speck of dust, uh, you know, in the cosmic swirl. You know, that's what first drew me to uh, cosmic horror, Lovecraft, and, and things like that. It's... Um, and and so I, I guess I didn't find that horrifying, but I found it 
interesting and I found it cool that someone could write about uh, a universe where there there aren't really any you know benevolent gods of, of, of any stripe it's just it's just all and well and, and if there are gods they don't care about you and they'll just like run you over like a Mack truck over an ant um, <laughs> I thought that that was that was just a very interesting way to view the universe and that drew me in but I think now as, as I'm evolving a bit as a writer hopefully um, I, I am starting to bring bring the horror home a little bit and write about things that uh, I find personally scary. Uh, it usually has to do with my family, my, my daughter or my wife, you know, being threatened or, or things like that. And I, I'm, I'm going to explore more of those things going forward because I think that um, that's more satisfying to me if I want to write true horror and what I find r r really, really scary and unnerving so what's your writing process look like at the moment i mean coming from a screenwriting background i imagine that a lot in terms of screenwriting is planned in advance is that something you've been doing with your short story writing or have you kind of let it take a more organic path um probably probably the latter yeah with with, with screenwriting you would you know what i would do anyway um i would first um, plot everything out through bullet points, and then I would turn that into sort of a rough outline. Um, because I mean, because you have to hit certain markers. You have to hit, you know, the end of Act One, the end of Act Two, or the, you know, the, 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 there's a midway point, um, and then the end of Act Two, and then the beginning of Act Three. And so it, it has to follow these, these these sort of formulaic rules, which is something that I, that I, I always hated about screenwriting. Um, but I think now with um, writing prose, I, I'll, I'll have an idea or I'll have a, you know, a bit of dialogue or maybe some atmospherics or something and I'll just write that down and I'll keep it in a file and I'll, and I'll give it some, you know, lame title. Um, and then I'll go back to that as, a, you know, it, it, I have stories always swirling, I mean, like everybody, I have stories swirling around in my head all the time and I, I, I'll always chase the one that I feel, um, you know, the, the most strong about on that day. Unless you know, unless I, I, I'm taking on a story that I have to finish, and then I, I focus on that. But if I'm in between stories, um, I'll, I'll sort of write what hits me that day, and it, it could happen in the shower, it could happen at the gym, it could happen in, in the car. You know, things will just kind of come to me, and I'll make sure to write that down. But yeah, it, it is more organic, where I'll just have a, a paragraph or a, a bit of dialogue, and then I'll, I'll know where that goes in the story, and then write around that. Um, I'll, you know, and there's been times when I wrote the ending first and then had to write backwards, basically. Um, it, 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 it depends on what comes to me when and where that fits in the story, and then I'll just, you know, write with that in mind. I, I, I don't have any sort of, you know, advice about writing because, because the way that I do it probably isn't, um, you know, it's, it's probably not effective or smart, but that's just the way that I work. Can you remember the best piece of writing advice that you've had or read? Um, uh, well, 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 probably it, it probably came from Ivy because she, because she read most of my earlier stuff, actually all my earlier stuff, and and you know she she's my editor and she would just she would read a line that I thought was real sweet. I thought it was real clever, and and, and I would hear her in another room, like I would probably be writing a, a new story and she'd be re reading an old story and and I would hear her just go ew <laughs> or she would go oh my god and then I would go in there and she would have written on on the page she goes no no this is garbage <laughs> and I used to get very upset because I'm like, I'm like how dare you think that's garbage that's brilliant and I, I you know I, I learned you know a, a little bit through screenwriting because it, there, there's so much more rejection of your work but but mainly through having Ivy as as my editor that not everything is precious, not everything has to stay in, that you can cut twaths and uh, paragraphs and pages if, if, it's, if it's on a tangent that I think is clever or cute, you know, and just writing clean, staying, staying true to the story, um, you know, and, and I, you know, I, need, I need to get out of my way sometimes with writing because I tend to uh, just get off on tangents and sort of entertain myself and, you know, working with her back and forth and it's, and it's been tough on occasion because you know I had a writer's ego um, but I I learned through her to just um, cut out the fluff keep it clean keep it clean and that's when that's actually why I 
titled my story clean it was sort of a tribute to her an homage to her um a thank you to her because you know i i, I wrote a story called clean that i felt was um a, a very clean story as far as you know not overwriting not putting too much in that it doesn't need to be in there um so then i think that combined with um Joe Lansdale, which I, I don't think this is original to him, but he just, you know, I think I read last year or a couple of years ago. He said, if you want to write, put your ass in the chair and write. Don't make excuses. Don't say, oh, well, I, you know, I need to make sure everything's right. I need to do scented candles and this kind of music, or I need, I need to be at a coffee shop, or I need to wear a goofy hat or, or, or whatever. Uh, just put your ass in the chair and write. Even if you don't feel like it, because you know you can edit while you know if, if if you're not feeling at that moment, you can edit what you've written, and then something can pop up. I've there's been times when I've uh, I've, I've written where I haven't really felt like writing, but and so I'll, I'll edit, and then I'll come up with with maybe like a bit of dialogue or just one single twist to a story that changes the whole thing, and then everything else unspools from that. Um, so you know. If you want to write, you know, just write. Sit down, open up that that story, that novel, or even up a blank page and just start writing. It doesn't have to be gold. Um, you know, you can always edit later, but just you know, sit your ass in, in the chair. Don't make excuses. Turn off your phone, and write. And I think this is how a lot of people fall down, isn't it? Either looking for these optimal conditions that don't exist or beating themselves up because, you know, they think their writing is particularly bad that day, but... Of course. I mean, like, yeah, everyone has self-doubt, but you can't realistically expect what you're writing in the first draft to be amazing out the gate anyway. So I think, I think maybe the danger is that there are people who are setting standards that are so high that no one could meet them, <laughs> so... It's tough. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think that people are are scared because writing is scary. It's you know if you sit down and write and 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 it, and it comes out crap, um, you know, it's it, it starts self doubt about oh you know have have I lost it? Um, you know, am, am I having writer's block? And it it doesn't have to be gold like you said you know, the, the first time out. That's that's the beauty of writing prose is that you can or anything really I mean you can rework it you can um, toss it out you, you can you can save one sentence from a, an entire page it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it, it's all good and once it's on the page it's it's alive and once it's alive you can kind of mold it and, and shape it it's you know when it's when it's in your head it's it, it's, it's not alive and it hasn't been born yet so Get it, get it on the page, make sure that it, it lives, and then train it, you know, treat it like a child. Um, and, yeah, and, and I just think that writing is, is so scary and so personal to, to people. And, and, and people, when they, want to, when they write, they want to be good. They want it, they want it to be good, and, and they're constantly worried, I think, all, all writers, that when they write something, it'll be shit, and, and, and they won't, you know, they won't like it or... It, they think that it won't be as good as their last story, but it, it doesn't matter. It, it really it doesn't matter. You, you're not on a deadline unless you are. Um, so 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 just get it get it on the page and then worry about making it pretty later. Yeah, absolutely. I think you've completely nailed it with that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm so wise. <laughs> so. What do you think are the best and the worst things that are happening in the horror genre now? Or the dark fiction genre, to make it wider? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the best things, I think, are just... It, it, it seems like the, there's a lot of writers writing really good fiction. I, I don't know if it's, it's always been this way, but people that have been doing it far longer than I have are, are saying, and I'm sort of, you know that from them that you know we're in a golden age or a resurgence of um, you know weird fiction dark fiction horror fiction um, so that seems to be the best thing that's, that's happening right now is that and, and I think that has a lot to do with Facebook social media and blogs and also like you know outfits like yours small press outfits where people that like this 
type of fiction are, are you know, saying, I'm going to put out books. I'm going to put out books for because, you know, the bigs can't put out every book. They, they can't, put, and, and especially they're not going to put out every book when it comes to horror fiction because they, they, think, it, they think it's silly. Um, so I think that um, um, being able to publish through Amazon or publish through, um, you know, online uh, uh, print to order, Print to order, print print on on demand, POD sources. I think it has has really helped um, give more writers and more editors, publishers, um, the you know the access to readers. Also, but on the flip side of that, you know, I've you know I'm part of these groups uh, <laughs> on Facebook where it's like you know uh, uh, you know. Horror fiction now, and you know that you know uh, uh, promote your work here. And I've just seen, and again, this is you know covers only, but also from the descriptions, I've just seen a proliferation of just really, really crappy looking, quote unquote, horror books. And I think that again, that you know, as there's more on the market, there's more writers who I think are good. I think anyone who's who's a fan um, who probably shouldn't be writing. Which is, I mean, you know, maybe that sounds, sounds like I'm being a snob or whatever, but I think that, you know, not everybody was made to write. And you can be a fan of, of something, but that doesn't mean that you can actually create that thing. Um, and so I've seen lots of self-published books that sort of um, thin the waters for dark fiction. And it's just the most cheesy, like, pseudo-romance covers and things like that. And, and you know, again... I'm judging a, a, a book by its cover, but I think that if if that's what you think is a good cover for for your book, and then it's it, it's you know the description is about you know some bodice ripping sort of uh, vampire tale, I think it's probably going to be shit. So <laughs> I think that lots you know I think that small press publishing, print on demand, has helped has helped the genre, but I think it's also harmed it as well. Because it's brought more more of the cream to you know to the top, because it's given outlets to people that you know if they don't have an agent or they're not signed to one of the bigs, they probably wouldn't have a book out. But it's it's also given you know the opportunity to any fan, any you know mouth breathing person <laughs> to put out their own book, and you know they'll sell ten thousand because they'll you know mark it down to a dollar or something uh, you know for for the Kindle, and it, it'll be considered a, a, a hot-selling horror book. And then I think people outside the genre will, 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 will look in the fishbowl and say, oh, well, that's what's going on in, in horror fiction? Well, then, you know, I, again, silly. Nonsense. Nonsense. So I don't, you know, I think it's good and bad what's, what's going on with um, small press. But, I mean, I think it's mostly good because it is giving opportunities, you know, to people like me um, to put out books. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, what I'm putting out is great or anything, but it's it, it has given me the opportunity to publish. And it's given opportunities to peers that I know. I mean, you know, Adam Neville is, I think, writing at the top of, you know, top of the game. But, you know, if, you know, if I don't have a deal that Adam Neville has and, you know, an agent and a publisher and things like that, then, then, then I probably couldn't get my book out there. So small press outfits have allowed me to publish all my stories so you know i'm thankful for that and of course from the small press you do see people then obviously getting signed to bigger presses so exactly yeah. exactly <clears throat> it's the minor leagues i guess you know to put it in a in a, in a you know or, or or it's like you know it's like college sports you know you, 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 everyone goes out for the team but you know those you know five to ten guys off of each team have a shot at the pros but you know but there has to be that that time to train and develop and get stronger and faster and learn the game so i think you know that there, i guess there could be a parallel with um you know amateur sports with 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 pro sports yeah and so it, it allows you to work on your craft work on your art and then if you're good enough hopefully you know you can sign you know sign to a major publisher. I suppose the only problem with the analogy is that, you know, we see some small presses, um, so like uh, Cuisine, for example, 
who are putting out better quality fiction than some of the bigger presses and obviously we know that this is because i mean the more it becomes about the money and the less about the art um the more you have got to look at is this commercially viable for me i think really like you've got to have your integrity um otherwise it just becomes (laughs) no fun at all but it it is difficult because you are obviously selling a product but i think when you sell it to the detriment of the art that's when it becomes problematic so it's looking at striking that balance um but where obviously the analogy works very well and indeed what you were saying obviously the major book publishers a small press isn't going to be able to match that in terms of the advance you're going to get in terms of the financial uh, remuneration that you're going to get and indeed um, in terms of just the power they can put uh, behind the marketing and the advertising I agree I agree and but and I think that you know it's it, it the lines almost become blurred between what what is small press and what is major press um because like you said cheesing um and and others um left the press undertow um you know a a whole i'm sure i'm I'm leaving out a a million that i should be saying but um you know they're they're putting out quality books that match any of the majors and they're putting out the best writers in, in 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 the genre and so what so what is is the difference because it's not Simon and Schuster. I mean, if if it doesn't have that label on it, that 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 gold seal, does that make it lesser? I don't I don't think so. And I think that I think that the small press publishers that are that are putting out horror fiction understand horror fiction better, and and have a a, a love for it that I, I I would trust them more, for the most part. Um, then, then I would trust a, a major because I think that when you're th- that big a, of a corporation, you're thinking about the bottom line always because you, know, you, you have to sell books. So is I mean, so then it almost becomes like Hollywood. It becomes um, will, will that, that appeal to the most people because it's good, or will, will it uh, appeal to the most people because it, because it's an easy read, or because because it it follows you know a, an established trope that has has sold in the past. So is that better? Um, and I think that the smaller presses take chances on things because it's great, um, because it's you know because you know it, it's a great story or because that author is great, and you know so I don't make any uh, you know I, I I would probably buy small press before I'd buy major press unless it was an author that I really loved like Paul Tremblay or Adam Neville or Michael Marshall Smith or or, or someone like that or Tim Lebin. Um, be, because you know, I I trust the, the people that run those small presses to love horror fiction enough to want to put out the best stuff, to put out the most interesting stuff. Because they probably read more horror fiction than anyone at the bigs combined, and so hopefully they're gonna find that you know those gems to put out. So what what do you think are some of the advantages of technology these days in terms of how it's helped and then also how do you think it's hindered both writers and readers Hmm, that's interesting i i I often wonder how someone wrote on a typewriter back in the day because you know if you write that sentence and and you don't like it or or you messed up because i i misspell things uh chronically then then i guess you have to go back through with you know by hand and, and 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 correct it and i i think that there was I don't know. I think that it was you had to be a little bit more serious and, and on point when you wrote on a on a typewriter, um, as as opposed to a word processor. But research is is so much easier now with the internet. And I think that you know it would have taken uh, you know someone like me if I, if I wanted to write about the Revolutionary War like I did in White Feather, I would have had to go to the library and, and sit there for weeks probably and, and to to get the, the the details I needed for the story. But now I can go online and I can find everything about the, the, the Revolutionary War in you know a second, and then I can just I can read it and then I can add what I just read to my story, you know, in in real time. And it's it's sped up the process for sure. But I mean I don't know if that's a good thing because 
I think back in the day there was more refining, and I think you had to rewrite your stories more because I, you know, to, to get a clean copy to send off to an, an editor or a publisher. So I think it's broadened the world. It's made the world smaller as far as research and reaching out to people from different countries and cultures and and um, but um, you know at the same time I think it's it's you know it's taken some of the work out of it and I think that you know after hard work something's better um, I think if it's too easy it doesn't you know it might not be as tight it might not be as strong in the end. Um, but, but also, I, I think social media has really, really helped um, writers like me connect with um, other writers, publishers, editors, agents, people like that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's my way to get my work out there and to network, I guess, to you know, put it in a Hollywood sort of uh, parlance. Um, so I think that it's, it, it's helped. And then, again, this goes back to print on demand. If, if you're a small press outfit, you don't have to order a thousand books and, you know, mortgage your house to do it. You can just have each book that you sell, that you signed, you know, you sign an author and then and their books are coming out. Each one will just be printed once it's paid for. So it takes the risk out of it. So I think it's allowing people who don't have the means normally to, um, you know, set up a brick and mortar or something and, and then, um, you know, order a giant book order for their uh, first book, for their first author, um, it can just be printed as it's paid for, which takes the risk out of it. There's, um, there's one thing that I wanted to ask you, actually. So you've got, you've got a blurb for your, for your book from Gary McMahon, one from Ray Cooley. Uh, how, did yeah. you, uh, how did you become kind of connected with the, the British scene? How did you uh, get to know about some of these guys? Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I know almost everybody that I know in the horror scene from Facebook, which and, and that's another way that technology has really helped me. Um, and you know, I, I, I sort of vibe with the Brits. Um, I always have, and um, I like their work, and they seem they, they, they like my work. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it was just sort of interacting online and sort of you know trading jokes and barbs and things like that, and then um, you know. It always just takes that, that one person and then you sort of meet, not meet, but you sort of interact with their friends and things like that. And it grew from there. And I've known Ray and known him um, online for a while, maybe four years now. And we've always vibed really well. Gary as well, Adam Neville, um, Michael Marshall Smith, uh, you guys. Uh, yeah, I just, I just always have, I don't know, I, I vibe with Brits. <laughs> <laughs> probably years of growing up on monty python um i just i i, know, I guess I, i'm a sort of a minor anglophile in that way yeah i think there's some really really strong writers this side of the pond to be honest so ted we commissioned a new story from you a few months back announced that on the website but we haven't revealed a lot of details we've been keeping it quite quiet so yeah I wondered if you fancied letting our listeners know a little bit about the stories that you're working on. Um, yes, actually. Well, I'm, I'm working on two stories. The first story that I, I you know, have the most work done on. Um, it's, you know, I, I, I always hesitate to say that it's a, you know, a piece of vampire fiction, but it, it is. I mean, that's, I guess, that's the core of it. But I, 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 I hope that I'm doing something new with it and sort of putting my own spin on it and it really isn't about that it's it's more about obsession and it's about um, um, yeah. narcissism and peaking too soon um, you know in your life and um, it, I, I think it, it's more about the human qualities um, I, I, that's, that's not a very good way to describe it uh, yeah, it's 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 dark. It's um, but and and it has you know the, the core is a vampire tale. But I think that I'm doing something new with it, which is the only reason why that I I wanted to do a vampire story. I wanted to put put my um, I wanted to explore it in my own way, um, and I think I'm doing that. And I, I guess that's all I'll really say at this point because I don't want to give anything away. 
I can I just throw my opinion? They aren't vampires unless they sparkle. So please make sure that they do. <laughs> no sparkling at all. Actually, it's it's quite the opposite. Which I mean, I guess would seem like a natural reaction to that. But um, I, I'm sort of taking on vampires as sort of a um, real life microbe based um, disease, as as opposed to anything supernatural. Uh, uh, but I, I still have you know some of the same elements to it, but it's it's more based in science, and um, and you know and it's it's also focused on what what that sort of power can mean to people that don't understand it. I guess is is the best way to describe it. I'm not going to be very. That sounds really my To be fair, I. I, I, I I cut I cut in with my sparkly joke, but no, seriously, it does. Oh no, no, that's, that's really fine. I was I was waiting for that, Dan. So yeah, yeah. that was right on script. Good, good. Uh, I always <laughs> like to hit you know the right notes with the comedy timing. So <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you for that. Let's stay on script, please. <laughs> oh, oh, and then oh, then the other story that I'm I'm doing it's it's set in the doomsday seed vault um up, up in the arctic and um that's more of another claustrophobic piece that's more i guess uh weird as a, as opposed to following any sort of tropes and um you know it's i think that as as it as it unfolds um it's i guess it's very psychological in a way and it's about the cold desolation uh possibly the end of the world um so yeah that that's that's gonna be a, a fun one but i think i need a little more time to get my mind around that one but that's that's the second piece cool arctic horror is one of the greatest subgenres, i think personally i don't know about oh, you Michael, yeah. but that's, it, that's bang up there for me well yeah i mean it, it it you know that that's sort of an environment lends itself to um horror it's you know it's just it's 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 dark most of the time, and it's cold, and it's quiet, and you know it's at either like the top of the world or the bottom of, of the world, and so it, it seems almost like it's closer to the universe, and um, you know lots of strange things can happen there, and and do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right. Well, we're gonna have to wrap things up in a minute, but I wondered. Man. Sorry. I said, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> so. Where can our listeners connect with you? Um, they can, I guess, they, they can find find my blog, which is called the Cosmo Comic Con. Um, that's I, I don't really blog as much as I used to because I'm um, busy writing and living. Um, but you know, it's it's still something that I always go back to, to, you know, to announce news and to do reviews and interviews and things like that. But you know, they can find me on Facebook. Um, they can find me on Amazon. They can find me on Goodreads. Um, yeah, I guess all all the normal spots where writers hang out. <laughs> and as a final question, are there any writers that intimidate you? Oh, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Talking about Lawrence Block earlier, he he does for sure. He writes in such a clean way, and 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 I know I have to say Flannery O'Connor terrifies me more than any other writer that's ever lived because Flannery writes the way that I wish that I could write. I wish that I had the skills and the confidence to write the way that she writes. And and, and just the brain. She writes in such a clean um, clean way, but it, it's also very dark and horrifying without you know, relying on any crutch of the supernatural. And she combines humor in there and elements of family and but 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 also but you know, because of of the style of writing that I like, it's also very, very dark. But you know, it it seems dark, but it it seems dark and like right down the block from you. Like it, it could happen in in your in your life, or it could happen in your neighborhood. And she's just a master. She's probably the the you know the greatest writer that's ever lived for my money. Um. So yeah, I think Flannery. I think Lawrence Block. Um, Poe. I mean, I don't I don't think anyone can write like Poe. Um. He. I mean, and just just. The way that he was so poetic, to uh, to pardon the pun, <laughs> um, you know, he's just you know he's just on a whole other level, um, and so those are the writers that you know that 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 I can't touch, but you know who act as as um, goals for me as like you know 
they're you know they're on top and I, I'm, I'm always trying to and I you know judge my work based on 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 their output and their talents all right well what a great note to end on and thank you so much for you know talking with us today and taking up so much of your Sunday to be here oh no worries no worries this has been Really, really fun, and I, I'm, I'm sorry if I rambled. I didn't have anything prepped. I probably should have had um, one of my classic screenplay outlines for this so to make sure <laughs> that I hit all my points. Um, yeah, you know, as a writer, I'm not used to talking about my work, and you know, it's it's not one of my favorite things. But I really appreciate the time, and I'm really I'm really excited to put my work out with you guys. Um, you know, this is you know, it, it's sort of a clean slate now, and 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 hopefully what I'm writing and working on um, lives up to, you know, the expectations from your press. So uh, thanks for that, guys. We're really looking forward to it, Ted. Okay, Very excited awesome. excited to have you on board. Wonderful. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast with T.E. Grau. It's competition time again. So last time we gave away a Barbie Wilde book and the winner of that competition is Sean Leonard. This week we're giving away a copy of The Nameless Dark, the short story collection by T.E. Grau. And we're also giving away five electronic copies of The Nameless Dark. So to be in with a chance to win either the physical copy or one of the five electronic copies, please send an email to michael at thisishorror.co.uk subject line TE Growl Competition. It really is that easy. As always, if you want to support the show, please consider pledging just $1 a month on our Patreon page. That's www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror or head on over to itunes subscribe to the podcast rate the podcast or leave us a review all of these things help with the itunes algorithms and so make us more visible to potential listeners so whether you rate whether you subscribe whether you review we really do appreciate your support so that's it for this time Next week, we will be back with a David James Keaton short story. Until next time, take care.